It used to be one of the most popular programmes on television. Hosted at its peak by Chris Tarrant, and now on TV, it's led by Jeremy Clarkson. And the title of the programme tells you the reason for its popularity. Who wants to be a millionaire? Hundreds of thousands of people answer, I do. With the result that, particularly at its peak, the income from all of those phoning in more than matched the huge prize money that they gave away. Wow, imagine that. One million pounds hanging on the answer to one question. What an important question. Imagine this morning that you are sitting in the hot seat and that Chris Tarrant or Jeremy Clarkson is asking you that one question. The most important question you'd ever have to answer. Or so you might think. But in fact, in life, there are far more important questions that we need to answer. And the most important, the most important question in the world asked by Jesus when he was on earth 2,000 years ago is this. Who do you say I am? Get it right? Jesus claimed and you will live forever. Get it wrong and you lose everything. So let's try to get the right answer by looking at the occasion where Jesus asked his followers this million pound question. And as in the show, contestants are offered three lifelines to help them get the right answer. If they're stuck, they can, number one, they can ask the audience. And number two, they can phone a friend. Or number three, they can go 50-50. Or at least that was the format when the show first started. This morning... Jesus is the question master instead of Chris Tarrant or Jeremy Clarkson. So let's try to get the right answer to his question. Who do you say I am? It's found in this book in Mark's Gospel. The story of Jesus written, not surprisingly, by a man called Mark. And this morning we have these same three lifelines to help us answer Jesus' great question. Who do you say I am? And so the first lifeline is number one, ask the audience. You see, the very first question that Jesus asks his followers is not, who do you say I am? That's in verse 29. But before that, he asks in verse 27, who do people say I am? You see, Jesus has been traveling throughout Israel for almost three years And fast crowds have been following his progress. Some of them, literally. Not surprisingly, he's the topic of every conversation. Not just the talk of the town, but the talk of the whole nation. Who is this person who who can walk on water, give sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, healing to the lame, food to the hungry, even life to the dead? Who is he? What kind of man can preach and teach like this, Mark asks, with words of authority, unlike the conventional religious leaders? Who is this Jesus? Everyone has formed an opinion. So, Jesus asks his followers, who do people say I am? And the answers show that there is no unanimity of opinion from the audience. Verse 28, the disciples replied, some say John the Baptist, Others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Now those answers may seem strange to us, and for good reason. Most of us are not Jews. But the people who saw and followed Jesus were Jews, and he himself was a Jew and lived his whole life in Israel. And the Jews understood their figures through their religious writings, the Hebrew scriptures, uh, what Christians call the Old Testament in our Bible. And the last words of the Hebrew Bible contain this cryptic promise that God would send Elijah back before the end of the world, what the prophets in the Old Testament called the day of the Lord. You can look it up for yourself if you want to in Malachi chapter 4. So because of that prophecy, that was why some people thought that Jesus was Elijah. Others thought that he was some prophet, Old Testament prophet, come back from the dead. Then nearer in time, yet others still, they thought that he was John the Baptist, 
a strange and eccentric figure who emerged from the wilderness region of Israel, calling people to turn from their evil ways and to show that they sincerely trusted in God by immersing themselves or being baptised in the water of the River Jordan. Now, John the Baptist was so outspoken that it literally cost him his head at the hands of the king, King Herod by name. So, some people thought, because John the Baptist had been executed, that Jesus was John the Baptist come back to life. Now, that was 2,000 years ago. Very few people today think that, that Jesus was John the Baptist or Elijah. No, today some people say that Jesus was a great moral teacher. Others, that he was a religious mystic with supernatural powers. Or he was a madman, even, some claim, an evil deceiver. Then some academics claim he is simply an invention of the church. Yet others paint him as a political freedom fighter and a champion of the poor who was eliminated by the power brokers of his society. Now, many of these modern opinions seem to us weird and wonderful and totally illogical. In fact, easily demolished with the, the minimum amount of investigation. But there's nothing new about that. Even a, a superficial investigation of the facts would, uh, would knock some of the claims that they were making in Jesus' day down too. For example, Jesus was the cousin of John the Baptist. Their, mother, their mothers were sisters. Also, Jesus had, and it was witnessed by many, had been baptised personally by John the Baptist. Now, Clark Kent may never be present at the same time as Superman, and Bruce Wayne is always mysteriously absent whenever Batman is doing something, but clearly, obviously, Jesus and John the Baptist are two different people. But, But no matter... These are just opinions, aren't they? And if you ask the audience on this question, who is Jesus, you will get no clear answer, no definitive help. In fact, even if there was a majority opinion, you'd be foolish to go with it. And I think that suits a lot of people. Perhaps this morning, it even suits you. You know, no, you're thinking no one can really be sure who Jesus was or is. That means there's no way you can be certain No need to commit yourself to a particular answer. But I want us to think about that question this morning. And before you take this option, I would suggest this intellectually lazy and spiritually dangerous option. What we're going to do now is we're going to sing a song. Now this is not an ad break like in the TV show. We've deliberately planned it this way to give you time to think about this question. In 2021, who is Jesus? Who do you say I am? Because when we come back, I'm going to suggest it would be much wiser to avail yourself of a second lifeline. So we're going to sing now, By Faith We See the Hand of God. So welcome back to the million pound question. After Ask the Audience, secondly we have Phone a Friend. You see, back to the story, to when Jesus asked this million pound question. After asking his followers who other people think he is, Jesus turns to them directly and asks, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And one of their number, one of the disciples, Peter by name, immediately volunteers an answer. Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Peter answers that Jesus is the Messiah or the Christ. Uh, They're basically the same word. Christ is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah, which literally means the anointed one. The Messiah, the one God has promised to send to bring in his kingdom on earth. And so Jesus, the question master, says to Peter, well done, congratulations, 
That is the right answer. He has got the correct answer to the most important question in the world. Jesus is not some ordinary man, not even a prophet, not even Elijah or John the Baptist. No, Jesus is the one appointed by God and anointed by God. The most important person in the whole universe. The Messiah, the man behind every millennium, the one who will bring the whole of history to its conclusion. But how did Peter get the right answer? Certainly, as we've seen, it wasn't by asking the audience. Uh, Was Peter a bit brighter? Was he more well-educated? Was he more intelligent than the other disciples that Jesus had chosen? how, How come Peter got it right? Well, at this point, we briefly get a bit of help from Matthew. Matthew was one of the other of Jesus' disciples who wrote Matthew's Gospel. And in Matthew, in writing his gospel, when he tells this story, he adds just another little piece of information that helps us answer this question. So in Matthew's gospel, Jesus explains to the other disciples how Peter has got it right. He says, Peter, you are truly privileged by God because you didn't work this out by yourself. God, my father, gave you the correct answer about who I am. So, let me be personal and practical. All the evidence about the identity of Jesus is there for all to see, recorded in the accounts of his life. So, get hold of a gospel, get hold of a Mark's gospel, read it and study it. If you haven't got a gospel at home, uh, if you're watching this on the internet, you must have access to the internet, go online. There are free websites like Bible Gateway and you can read all of the Bible if you want. Certainly all the Gospels for yourself. So read them. Uh, Likewise, you could contact the church. If you contact us, we'd be delighted to send you a free copy of the New Testament. Get hold of Mark's Gospel. Read it for yourself. The evidence will bear scrutiny. Believe me, Jesus and the Gospels, they've been subjected to more scrutiny more criticism than all the other figures of history, all the other books in the world combined. And yet, Jesus still stands. And his word stands. And to this day, even in the third millennium, people in their millions, in fact probably billions, follow him to this day. They still arrive at the right answer to the most important question in the world and confess As Peter does in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. But they, and you, will never arrive at this right answer without outside help. So what you need to do today is phone a friend. And there is only one friend who will be able to give you the right answer, but also the assurance that it is the right answer. Indeed, in the, uh, the latest version of the TV show, uh, they, I'm sure those of you who watched the Jeremy Clarkson version will know that they've added a fourth lifeline. So on top of the other three, you now also have the option to ask the host. Now, I would suggest that, particularly on this subject, Jeremy Clarkson will not help you. But here in Mark 8, asking the host is exactly the right thing to do. In other words... Pray, pray, ask God to reveal to you the identity of his son as you read Mark's gospel. Ask him to show you who Jesus is. See, when you speak to God, you will soon discover that he is never too busy to listen. His line is never engaged and he's always willing to answer people who ask him to reveal the true identity of his son, Jesus, the Messiah. And I also want to say that if you've already done this, then you begin 2021 already amazingly favoured and privileged. You are indeed blessed if God has answered your prayers in showing you who Jesus is. You, you may never be a millionaire, but already you are better off than any multi-billionaire because you know the true identity of Jesus. And have trusted in him. 
But for others, perhaps you're interested, but no more. You know, in, in the supermarket of religions, this seems just like another option and you can just pick and taste and, and see if you like it. But I want to say, and we see from Mark 8, that it is far more than that. Because Jesus goes on to explain to the crowds who are listening to him that there is a third and a final lifeline. Finally, we get to 50-50. You see, after Jesus had spoken to Peter and then he turns to the crowd, he presents to them this 50-50 option. Did you see that at the end of the passage? Either Jesus is who he claims to be, the Messiah, the Son of God, or he is not. You have to make your choice about him and answer his question. Not standing behind anyone else. Who do you say I am? Jesus asks. It is a 50-50 choice. And the stakes are very high. Because this is not a quiz program, you know, where you can, you can back off the hard last question and actually still walk away with thousands of pounds. No, it's not a quiz or a game, but Jesus says it's a matter of life and death, all or nothing, winning your life or losing your life. You see, throughout history, the human race has had plenty of teachers, but sadly, they have not ultimately, fundamentally, made the world a better place. The First World War was called the war to end all wars, but as we know, was simply replaced by the Second World War. See, there is something fundamentally wrong with humanity. Much more than a teacher, we need a rescuer. And that is why Jesus came. See, that's the strange answer that we're going to discover next term, during this term, as we study Mark's Gospel. Mark poses the question, why did Jesus come? And the answer Mark, Mark's Gospel gives is... Jesus came to die. That's why he came. And I don't have time to explain this fully, all the mechanics of how it works, but somehow his death and resurrection are able to make anyone reconnect, be uh, reintroduced into relationship with God the Father because of the death of Jesus. And not only put you right with God, but help to restore any broken relationships that you have. Now, as I say, I don't have time to explain exactly, I don't have time in detail to go into that, but if you are interested in those questions, I'd again really encourage you to come along to our Christianity Explored course on Zoom starting soon. All the details are on the website. Investigate that, ask questions, look into it. But back to the million pound question. In order to win the big prize so that we can live forever, Jesus had to lose his life, we read here, to be nailed on a cross. So it cost him everything, and it will cost you everything to follow him, to lose your life by giving it to him. Or instead, you could try to carry on hanging on to your life but then Jesus says, in the end, you will lose everything. For Jesus said, what good will it be if you gain the whole world, yet lose your soul? So let me challenge those of you who have been sitting on the fence, who think you remain half-hearted and uncommitted. You know, wanting life, yet refusing to give up your life. There is, according to Jesus, only two options left. So, as I've said, get a gospel, read it, phone a friend, investigate for yourself, go along to Christianity Explored, come along on Sunday mornings as we work our way through Mark's Gospels, take your time. See, on the one hand, I don't want to put any emotional pressure on you and make you think that, that you have to commit to Jesus now before you're ready. But on the other, I do want to make very, very clear the seriousness of the choice before you. And I want to say, come clean, that as a pastor, I find this bit really difficult. Because when I say take your time, I really mean it. I never, I genuinely never want anyone to feel pressurized, to sort of 
make some decision or pray some prayer or do something that they're not ready to do. Likewise, if the gospel is true, it really can withstand investigation. Ask all the questions you want. Here we're not scared of rigorous scrutiny. You know, when I, sometimes when I speak to, to atheists and agnostics and people like that, sometimes I feel as if they're sort of tiptoeing around me, that they're, you know, they don't really want to talk about religion because they think that my faith is so sort of weak and fragile that if they ask one of their killer questions, I'm going to crumble. So, so they, they sort of tiptoe around me and they're, they're scared that, that their lack of faith is somehow threatening to me. I want to say it's not quite the opposite. What I want to say is bring it on. Ask any question you like. All I want is a level playing field. If you can ask any question you want, then so can I. Let's investigate that. However, let's be honest, asking questions is also a very common procrastination technique, isn't it? Putting things off. Uh, For example, my eldest daughter is currently revising for her final exams and she's told uh, told me frequently that she wants to get back to Exeter as soon as possible because it's just too easy to procrastinate at home there's just too many things that she can do instead of revising well similarly with this million pound question that Jesus puts to us I want to say genuinely investigate as much as you like but as long as your searching is is heading somewhere Be honest with yourself about that. Are you using these questions merely as a smokescreen, merely to put off ever coming to a firm decision about this question? Every question, can't it? Every investigation is either a step towards faith in Jesus or a step away from him. So be honest with yourself about this. My challenge to you at the start of this year is make 2021 the year where you come to a firm conclusion about this question. Jesus asks you, yes, you personally today, forget everyone else, don't care about your parents or your relatives or friends, who do you say I am? It is a 50-50 choice. As my dad used to say, the only thing you get sitting on the fence is splinters up the bum. So make a decision. Choose. And therefore today I want to leave you with not my words, but with the words of Jesus. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? That is worth pondering as we start a new year. What do you really want in 2021? Your life or Jesus? Let's respond to that by singing this great hymn together. Let's use it as a prayer. Lord, be thou my vision.